So we're going to talk about um, pleural effusions and pneumothorax, and hopefully this shouldn't take the full hour. So we're going to talk about the diagnosis of pleural effusions, the management options for malignant pleural effusions, which is kind of what we see the primarily um, amongst the hospitalized patients. Um, and we're going to understand the types of pneumothorax and treatment. So we'll start with pleural effusion, effusion physiology. So there is usually a small amount of pleural fluid in the um, pleural space, about 10 to 20 cc's is normal. When it gets overwhelmed and pleural effusions develop, it's really this imbalance between the hydrostatic and oncotic pr pressure, so that production overwhelms removal. So you can see on the left here, the visceral pleura that lines the lung itself, the parietal pleura, which lines the chest wall. And there's usually a balance between the two. But pleural fluid is produced by the parietal pleura on the chest wall, but it's also absorbed by it. So that in the case of CHF, as an example, where you have increased pulmonary venous pressures, you have fluid that leaks into the interstitial space, the lymphatics on the parietal pleura usually absorb it. But when they get overloaded, overwhelmed, and they can't absorb it all, then you get translocation of the fluid to the pleural space and you get pleural effusions that develop. So just know it's really this um, balance and a lot of things in medicine, a balance between the hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. And that when they get um, the uh, parietal pleura get overwhelmed and um, the balance is producing um, where production outweighs removal, then you get a pleural fluid collection. Um, so who wants to tell me the diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria of a transudative pleural effusion? Anyone want to unmute themselves and give a guess? Um, so for LIGHTS criteria, um, you look at protein, LDH, um, and then you can also compare to sort of the lab value for LDH. Um, uh -huh. So if you have um, pleural protein to serum protein greater than 0.5 um, or the LDH to um, serum LDH greater than 0.6, um, or if the LDH in the pleural fluid is greater than two-thirds upper limits of normal. Okay. And that's going to be diagnostic of? And, and if you have any one of those, yeah, it would be an exudative. Correct. So mm -hmm. you need how many of them to make it a transudative? Uh, I think, oh, it would, it would need to be all three of them negative to Correct. be a transudative. Yeah. So less than, exactly. Mm -hmm. So pleural fluid protein over serum protein less than 0.5, LDH, um, pleural fluid over serum less than 0.6, and LDH less than two-thirds the upper limit of normal. All three of those to make a transudative effusion. One of them not meeting that criteria makes it an exudative effusion. So, good job. Um, so, there are other criteria because not everything fits neatly into that box there. Um, the majority does, but about 25% of pleural effusions that appear exudative may actually be transudative. So, there are additional criteria for that. Um, and that is mainly with um, people that have CHF and some diuretic use. So you can use the serum protein minus the pleural fluid protein if that's greater than 3.1, um, or what I usually use is the serum albumin minus the pleural fluid albumin if that's greater than 1.2, and you have somebody with heart failure that's getting diuretics, and it's more suggested that it truly is a translative effusion. You can use pleural fluid pro um, BNP as well, that's a lot harder to come by. So there are tons of etiologies for pleural effusions, transitive effusions, I, I touched on CHF, cirrhosis, renal failure, necrotic syndrome, hypoalbuminemia, um, sarcoid, which actually will fall into both a uh, transitive and an exudative um, effusion, as well um, PE. You can get um, urinothorax, so if there's any sort of fistula between the urinary system and the thorax, the CSF leak um, will present as a uh, transitive effusion as well. And then kind of everything else um, is, is malignant. Um, so that's, we're talking about your um, infectious etiologies, your rheumatologic etiologies, you've got some uh, weird ones like yellow nail syndrome, um, asbestos-related pleural effusions, um, post-cardiac um, surgery, cardiac disease, post-MI, um, you know, kind of address their syndrome picture, any sort of abdominal or gynecologic etiologies as well, um, and then medications. So there is a, a wide um, range of, of effusion um, etiologies, and going through this differential for an undifferentiated pleural effusion is always uh, quite important. Um, so what if you have an unexplained exudative pleural effusion? So you can repeat the thoracentesis. You do it once, you see it's exudative, you're convinced it's exudative, it's not malignant, it's not um, a um, true infectious etiology, then, um, and it comes back and somebody's symptomatic, so you're probably gonna wanna repeat it. You're gonna increase your cytologic yield with each successive drainage, not really wanting to drain more than three times because then you're really maxing out your um, cytologic um, 
uh, diagnostic criteria at that time. So you probably want to also check for other etiologies. Um, is this a TB-related effusion? Is this lupus-related? And kind of all the other etiologies that I would was kind of going through the differential of that. And if ultimately you can't find a cause, well, you should probably sample that parietal pleura and do a biopsy of it via medical thoracoscopy or um, a VATS pleural biopsy so we can figure out what's going on. And, you know, if you do think that it um, is medication-induced, you want to stop the medications um, and you want to really do a, a full search of uh, why you think this pleural fluid is there, but ultimately they may you know, need a pleural fluid, um, oh, sorry, a parietal pleural biopsy. And when we do that, we are really trying to diagnose a malignant etiology and making sure we're not missing that. Um, so what about parademonic effusions? So um, I did mention that um, exudative effusions uh, can be um, infectious. And um, this actually is a little bit timely because I just had a patient that I saw in clinic that had a um, suspected um, uh, exudative effusion, not that it's paramnemonic, but um, the importance of this is that um, you want to um, make sure that there's no, um, you know, that you are looking for an underlying pneumonia. Um, if you think that they have one, clearly you want to put them on antibiotics. And if they do have a large enough effusion, um, you do want to consider draining it. You want to make sure that you're draining it to try to um, optimize the clearance of the pleural space there. So you start them on antibiotics, you do a chest ultrasound, and you're looking for septations and loculations in the pleural fluid, which are basically, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it, um, but there's, it's stranding in a pleural effusion, meaning um, that the fluid should appear simple appearing, um, all black on an ultrasound, but if you start to see um, little strands of fibrin floating in that space or multiple loculations or septations but with like small little pockets, um, then that's much more suggestive of a um, complicated pleural effusion. So you want to try to drain it. Um, can you drain it? Well, is it large enough to drain? Can you drain it? Um, and if it does, then um, you're, you're about done, um, unless the fluid comes back. And then unless you start to see that there are signs of um, poor prognostic um, factors um, in the um, paradigmatic effusion, you can see those on the right there. Is there pus? When you drain it out, does it look like pus? Do you have a positive grand standard culture? Is the fluid glucose quite low? Is the pleural fluid pH quite low as well, less than about 7.15 or 7.25 is what we might see in the literature? And is the pleural fluid LDH very, very high? And if you see this, then you're going to want to try to clear out that space as much as possible. So it's not always going to clear with just a porous and pieces. And you may need to consider putting in a small board chest tube and doing TPA and DNAs um, uh, three times, um, twice daily so that you can clear out that space. And um, that is in the hope of trying to avoid a um, need for a back decortication where you surgically clean out that space. Um, there has been a large study that was um, back in the late uh, 2010s um, about this, about using TP and DNA, and it works. And it's called the MIST protocol, which you may hear us use. And it's really to try to get people that um, don't need surgery to avoid surgery or that a poor surgical candidate to avoid surgery as well. So paranormonic effusions definitely do need to be treated. If the pleural fluid is quite concerning, it needs to be drained usually with uh, more than a thoris and T-cyst, and you really do want to sterilize that pleural space. So that's um, what I have on regular pleural effusions. Do you guys have any questions on that? So we'll go on to um, malignant pleural effusions then. I'll spend a little bit of time on that. So the physiology of that is that it is um, lymphatic obstruction. And it's mainly, um, malignant pleural effusions are mainly, and of course you'll see other causes, but um, lymphatic obstruction from them is uh, due, um, is caused, I should say, in lung and breast cancer and in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, you get direct pleural invasion in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then you can also get direct invasion of the surrounding structures, the chest wall, the diaphragm, the mediastinum. And in lung cancer, it's a little bit different. So of course you can have lymphatic obstruction, but you also get hematogenous spread to the visceral pleura. And then when it migrates across, you know, onto the parietal pleura and it blocks that lymphatic drainage, that's kind of the mechanism of action of how um, lung cancer-related pleural effusions develop. Um, and like I said, it really is a combination of increased fluid production um, and decreased um, ability to uh, drain it from obstructive lymphatics and overwhelmed lymphatics on the parietal pleura. You can get a hemorrhagic um, malignant pleural effusion if you have direct blood vessel invasion or you get tumor angiogenesis. And um, there are studies that are being done about VEGF and soluble IQ receptors as being um, independently founded for a fluid and um, these um, can be independent predictors, um, sorry, predictors for um, progression-free survival. 
Then you may hear about a, a paramilitant effusion, and this is an effusion that's indirectly related to malignancy. So you could have a post-obstructive pneumonia, you could have atelectasis, you could have lymphatic obstruction from bulky mediastinal lymphadenopathy, um, a pleural effusion from a pulmonary embolus, so that when you drain these um, pleural effusions, you don't directly see that there are uh, cytologically proven cancer cells in the pleural fluid, but you do have some other etiology related to the cancer um, and um, going on in the body, and then you would say this is most likely a paramalignant effusion. So how common are they? Well, they're quite common. So the prevalence is greater than about 150,000 per year in the U.S. A little bit old data here from uh, 2012, but close to 130,000 yearly hospitalizations for um, malignant pleural effusion. So it is quite um, symptomatic, and um, these people can end up in the hospital from it. Um, the majority are exudative in nature, and um, you will find, um, even if they weren't symptomatic at time of um, you know, presentation or, or during the treatment for um, cancer, that you will find that about 15% of all patients that um, die from any malignancy will have a, a malignant pleural effusion. Uh, they are most common, like I said, with lung, breast, and lymphoma. Um, and about over half of the malignant effusions are due to these etiologies. Um, there actually is um, a high risk of recurrence um, when you present with a pleural effusion with lymphoma upon diagnosis. So if you diagnose lymphoma um, from a pleural effusion, then you have a high risk of um, disease recurrence from that. Um, about 15% of all new lung cancer patients will present with a malignant pleural effusion, and 30% of all lung cancer patients at any time will have this. So again, quite common. Um, the symptoms are cough, chest pain, dyspnea, dyspnea being the biggest. And the dyspnea is really from compressive atelectasis of the lung as well as um, compressive atelectasis of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is not able to work in the same way that it would. Um, and that is how you get the um, dyspnea that presents with it. You notice that I kind of left off hypoxemia and that's not usually a initial symptom of a pleural effusion. Um, it's really more of a dyspnea cough or, or chest pain related to it. So how do we diagnose them? We can diagnose them with thoracentesis. This is actually a, a great example here of a right side of pleural effusion. So the liver um, is off to the right with the white line above it being the diaphragm. This is compressive atelectasis of the lung. And this is a simple appearing pleural effusion here where the, um, the fluid is um, anechoic in appearance. Um, I did mention that you are able to increase your sensitivity of diagnosis with each drainage to about 60% sensitivity for finding a positive fluid cytology on the first drainage, 87% with the second. And on the third, it really only increases into about the low 90s or so. And this is often seen more when you have adenocarcinoma. So you may still have um, a malignant pleural effusion and you may not um, you know, be able to diagnose it on thoracentesis. And that's when you do need to consider doing a parietal pleural biopsy, which I mentioned. So this is when we put a camera into the pleural space, we drain out the fluid and then we take biopsies of the parietal pleura, and you can see all this studying on the wall here. This is abnormal here and studying here. So you take biopsies of that, um, and you significantly increase your sensitivity of getting a diagnosis of a malignant effusion in that um, manner. Um, so like I uh, mentioned, it is a poor prognostic sign. Although I want to say, uh, this is old data here. So this is data that is um, kind of in the pre-immunotherapy era. So I do think that this is going to change over the next couple years or so. But usually it was a three to 12 month survival when you presented with a malignant pleural infusion. So it can have a negative impact on your quality of life and about 100% of them can recur within about a month. And so that's why we follow these patients closely looking for symptomatic reaccumulation that can be treated. Um, the presentation of them um, can vary um, with the um, cancer type that you have. So if you have a small cell lung cancer that presents with a pleural infusion, it's probably about a median six month survival and then lymphoma actually has a much higher survival, medium 26 month survival when you present with um, a pleural effusion and then everything else in between. But again, this is all in the pre-immunotherapy era. So I do think that these um, um, are gonna change and there's gonna be a longer quality of life just by the presence of a malignant pleural effusion. So we actually do have scoring systems that can help tell us um, what we um, think somebody's um, um, uh, life expectancy may be based off of certain factors as well as the subtypes of the uh, tumor that they have. So we know that um, in the past we've used the Karnofsky score and we knew that poor performance status correlates with mortality. So that if you had a lower um, 
Karnofsky score, you would have a lower um, uh, expected uh, duration um, you know, um, of, uh, of survival. And then if you had a higher Karnofsky score, it would be a higher. But there's actually a new score called the Lent score, which um, came out in the past uh, couple years or so, where it incorporates both the ECOG, which is your um, Eastern Cooperative Onco Oncologic Group, um, your performance status, um, plus the characteristics of the pleural fluid itself. So you can see that they look at the LDH, they look at the um, serum neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, and they look at the tumor type. And all of this together will come up with a low risk, a moderate, or a high risk um, of uh, this um, pleural fluid. And then based off of that, they can tell you, is this going to be, if it's a high risk um, tumor with a low um, um, ECOG uh, performance status, then you're probably going to have um, a lower expected um, medium survival but your survival will increase um, based off of some of the um, characteristics of a, a um, less inflammatory effusion and a better um, tumor subtype. So interestingly, you know, lung cancer here falls into a score of two. Um, so it really is um, a, you know, more of a moderate to high risk, meaning that the survival um, is a little bit lower with it. Um, questions about that? Okay. Um, there's one more score that we can use as sort of a prognostic score, and we incorporate this with pleural fluid biologic markers too. This is called the PROMIS score. Um, so you stratify into uh, poor and um, good survival, as well as the um, success of a pleurodesis um, or failure of pleurodesis. And um, this is actually um, not necessarily always used in practice, but um, it can be used as a, a biologic score too, where you are looking at um, proteins from the pleural fluid. Um, to determine whether or not they're going to get a successful pleurodesis with it if you were to drain this pleural effusion. So a little bit um, kind of um, early for a prime time and maybe more of a laboratory-based analysis at this time, but I think it's interesting and I think that something like this and the ability to um, more um, directly characterize pleural effusions and the ability for us to um, obliterate them based off of the likelihood of um, pleurodesis is kind of um, something that may be uh, coming in the future. So how are we going to treat them? Well, um, we have different ways. So the goal of the treatment of a malignant pleural effusion is really um, to improve somebody's shortness of breath, their dyspnea, and improve their quality of life. We want something that's affordable, that's well tolerated, that's minimally invasive, and that really keeps people out of the hospital. Because we know if they're expected to have a, a minimal um, expected survival, then we don't really want them to spend, you know, a week, two weeks in the hospital trying to take care of a pleural effusion. So what we really want to evaluate for is really the ability for the lung to re-expand. How are we going to treat somebody if the lung doesn't re-expand? Do they get a benefit with the drainage of the uh, pleural effusion? If you do a thoracentesis and it recurs, the pleural effusion recurs, but they don't get any benefit from it um, and no improvement in their shortness of breath, then there's really no need to try to keep intervening and, and keep treating it. And we want to know how quickly it recurs. If somebody has an effusion, but it doesn't come back for three months, then you may want to be a little bit less invasive in your treatment of it and really just um, treat it you know, as needed. Um, we can treat them palliatively where we don't really do anything. If we think that they have a markedly limited life expectancy, those are the ones that may be going to a hospice. Um, you're not going to want to do anything very invasive on them. You can really just treat it with um, opioids for dyspnea management and supplemental oxygen. And then you can also treat with the ther uh, intermittent therapeutic fluorocentesis. And the downside of this is that somebody has to come in for the procedure. Yes, it's only an outpatient thing, but they are here for a couple hours. It's painful to get it done. May, it may be painful for them to get it done. So you really will want to do those when you expect a very short life expectancy, less than about four weeks. Otherwise, you really want to try to find something that's going to um, give them a more durable um, course for um, getting rid of that pleural fluid so that they don't necessarily need to come back and forth to get this procedure done. So this is what we're looking to achieve pleuronesis. And the goal of that is to obliterate the pleural space via an inflammatory response. So you want to create this apposition of the parietal and the visceral pleural surfaces. So the parietal being lining of the chest wall, the visceral being the lining of the lung. And you're really doing this with an inflammatory process. And we have seen via recent um, um, studies that there are increased levels of, of VEGF and uh, um, another protein that will be predictors, like I said, of the successful pleurodesis. Um, so um, trying to figure out who might be um, a successful candidate for pleurodesis based off these proteins may be something we're doing in the future. 
Um, but one of the reasons that you're not going to want to do a pleurodesis um, is if you have trapped lung. So by this, I'm going to talk about the different types of pleurodesis we have. But if you have trapped lung, meaning that you have thickening of that visceral pleura, where the lung is not going to re-expand, then not allowing for that lung re-expansion um, so that it can touch that uh, parietal pleura is not going to allow for a um, successful pleurodesis. So in trapped lung, you're really looking to do a pleurex catheter to management the dyspnea, to manage the dyspnea that uh, accompanies those with a malignant pleural effusion. So pleurodesis on its own, again, we're going to go through the different modalities here, is usually about a median four to seven day hospitalization, but it can be quite successful up to about 100% success rate. And there are multiple ways that we do this. So you can do a surgical um, pleurodesis, general anesthesia, single lung ventilation. You can take um, biopsies of the pleura at that time, and you can spray talc or any other agent which we're going to talk about into the pleural space, create this inflammatory response, and obliterate that pleural space. You can do a medical thoracoscopy that is done in the um, in a procedure area or in the OR under moderate sedation. Again, uh, sticking a camera into the pleural space, taking biopsies and leaving talc or whatever your um, pleurodesis agent of choice is at the end. Or you can do it at the bedside, and that's by putting in a chest tube and then you instill um, talc or doxycycline or um, probidone iodine through the um, chest tube and you create the um, pleurodesis at that time. When you do it via the a chest tube, you really want to make sure that the pleural space is completely drained first, and you want to uh, make sure that you give the patient the best ability to have an inflammatory response to the parietal and visceral pleural surfaces stick together. Um, so there has been a lot of look, um, a lot of um, study of uh, pleurodesis um, and different um, sclerosing agents. So this is um, a picture on the right of talc, and we're looking at um, talc in different gradations and different um, um, uh, levels, scanning under an electron micrograph in different particle sizes. And um, the reason we're doing that is because we know that um, we have what we call graded talc, where less than 50% of the particles are small, so you actually want them to be a little bit bigger. Then you minimize any sort of uh, risk of bad outcome from um, using talc. And the complications being that you, they can have a little bit of a low-grade fever, some pain associated with it, Empyema with talc is very um, low and very um, unexpected. And then you can get an ARDS picture. And this is um, and up to about 10% of patients. And this is where you want to really make sure that you're using larger particle size talc so this doesn't occur. Um, and it is uh, basically a tri-layered uh, magnesium silicate sheet. It's asbestos-free. Um, we can use some small particle size in US. Um, a little bit larger particle size is used in Europe, and we can get some of the European top over here as well. Um, it is sterilized, and then this is the least expensive and most successful modality of um, allowing for pleurogesis. There are other um, uh, medications that you can use. In fact, they've been studied in um, varying uh, different studies. Um, talc is one I mentioned that is um, the most studied and the traditional and the most um, successful. You can use doxycycline. We had a shortage of talc about five years ago. You can use uh, silver nitrate, tetracycline, bleomycin, probidone iodine, basically anything that you can think of is that sclerosing agent to create the pleurogesis. Um, and uh, there are studies that are ongoing looking at the probidone iodine, which I mentioned before, where it's, um, it's a little bit more cost effective, it's a little bit safer, um, but the question is whether or not you're gonna get systemic absorption with it. So studies are ongoing on that. Um, and then if you are using some of the um, antibiotics, tetracycline, bleomycin, doxycycline, they have been found to be a little bit less effective than talc um, in, the, in the past on um, a, a Cochrane Review study. Um, and if you are trying to look at your tumor subtype and your successful pleurodesis and predict you know, what might be the best option, um, mesothelioma and lung cancer pleurodesis actually fails more often um, than breast cancer, which I think is a little bit interesting. So um, breast cancer um, and performing talc pleurodesis has been a little bit more successful than lung cancer. Um, so what if we want to decide how are we going to best instill it? How are we going to get a pleurodesis? Are we going to go in there with a the camera and do a, a poudrage, which is spraying it into the pleural uh, space, or are we going to have them just do a slurry where we instill it at the bedside? So there was a previous study. This was done in the early 2000s. Um, where they were looking at um, radiographic recurrence of um, a pleural effusion after 30 days, um, trying to figure out how should we, what's the best way to um, perform the pleurodesis. And the 30-day outcomes were similar. If you put a camera in and sprayed the talc on the pleural surface, 
or if you instilled it via chest tube. And um, interestingly, this um, subgroup of breast cancer and lung cancer patients favored a more invasive approach where you would um, spray it into the pearl surface um, you know, with the poudrage. Um, and, but the problem is, is that there are a little bit um, higher risk of respiratory complications uh, with that and um, respiratory failure. So this was um, a little bit of a landmark study, but also a little bit of a critical study. Um, and it was a, a smaller study as well. So there was a recent study that came out that readdressed this. And this is called the TAPS trial. This was a, a multi-center UK study. They had a smaller patient size um, of 333, uh, sorry, 330 patients. And again, they randomized them to either spraying the top of the pleural surface or instilling it via a chest tube. And they were looking at pleurity cyst failure at 90 days as the primary outcome. And what they found is that there really was no difference. There was no difference in if you were putting a camera in in a little bit more invasive way and putting talc in or just putting a chest tube in and putting talc in. Um, and then they looked at their secondary outcomes as well, looking at um, who's going to feel sooner, more pain, shortness of breath, all cause mortality, quality of life, length of stay. And they were all the same as well. So the jury's still out about the best way to do that. This may have been an underpowered study, and I think that more investigation is going to um, be warranted on this um, you know, in the future. So just quickly going through this before I move on to um, pneumothorax, but there are a couple of studies that we look at with management of um, chest tubes and um, lipid pleural effusions, the best way to manage them. Um, a lot of this data comes out of a uh, working group in Oxford in England, but the first we'll look at here is the time one trial, and I'll just refer to the graphs on the right. And basically um, what it's shown is that you don't necessarily um, need a larger board chest tube to be able to perform this um, pleurodesis. You can do it with a small board, and you don't necessarily need to avoid NSAIDs, which we kind of traditionally have thought to avoid, that cause an anti-inflammatory response, because we want a pro-inflammatory response to allow for pleurodesis. Um, so you can, um, based on this data, you can use um, NSAIDs um, as well as opiates without uh, really having pleurodesis failure after the immediate procedure. Um, we, I'm going to skip this for the, the sake of time here. So let's talk about an indwelling pleural catheter. So I mentioned trapped lung, and trapped lung is basically when you do not have the um, ability for the visceral and parietal pleural surfaces to stick together. So you would want to avoid a um, talc or medication-induced or surgical pleurodesis in those patients, but you want to control their dyspnea, so we put in a um, tunnel pleural catheter. And so this is a proprietary one. This is a Plurex catheter here. It's a 15.5 French catheter. The um, fenestrations here go down about half the length. Um, this is what goes into the pleural space. And the remainder up until the cuff here is tunneled under the skin. And the cuff causes an inflammatory response in the subcutaneous tissue. And that's how it's kept in place. Um, this is done as an outpatient. Um, it's done um, you know, in the procedure area here, but it's um, done as an outpatient where they go home the same day. Um, and the median time to pleurodesis is usually up to about 60 days. And we don't know if the pleurodesis is from um, an actual pleurodesis um, from the catheter causing some sclerosis of that space, or um, if it's just that the fluid is stopped accumulating and then because of that, the lung can stay um, a little bit um, you know, drier and you're getting a, a pleurodesis with that. So the data for this actually came from the TIME-2 trial. This was um, uh, actually four at TIME-1. <laughs> um, and uh, this was looking at um, treating um, patients with malignant pleural effusions with an indwelling pleural catheter or talc slurry via the chest tube. And their primary outcome was shortness of breath at 42 days, and they used a visual analog score. And they randomized people um, evenly between talc and versus the um, tunnel pleural catheter. And what they found is that early on, actually there was no difference. Um, in the first 42 days, there was no difference between putting a chest tube, putting talc in it, or putting an internal pleural catheter. But what they found is that in the long run, so at six months, you were actually having improved symptoms. And the catheter, even though it may still be there at six months, it really wasn't impacting their overall quality of life. But it was allowing for decreased length of hospital stay, need for repeat procedures, um, or intervention. So that the um, one-year readmission rate was a tiny bit higher in the, um, those with the tunnel pleural catheter, but it really was a non-significant um, number there. So this is where a lot of our data for using um, tunnel pleural catheters comes from, which is this time to trial. And you can see when you look at um, the survival benefits 
um, of this, there, um, when you go out to 12 months, um, maybe there's a little bit splitting of the curves here, um, although it, it is not um, significant um, between using talc and using um, these indwelling pleural catheters. Um, if you did, um, they did a post-op analysis, and they were looking at um, whether or not they could find the tumor subtract, so um, breast versus lung versus any other cancer, and did that um, allow for um, a, a change in survival time? And actually, if you had breast and lung, it was a, a increase in survival time when you use the indwelling pleural catheter. Um, it was a small increase um, of only about um, 0.1 months, but it you know, was significant. So how often do we drain these catheters? Well, we found that um, draining them more frequently is better. Um, this is from, it's called the ASAP trial, and basically what they were doing is draining the um, Plurex every single day, um, and then they were looking for um, the time that they were able to get it out. And, and when you did this aggressive drainage on this um, curve on the left here versus the standard and the standard being every other drain, uh, every other day drainage, you found that um, those that uh, drained it daily were a little bit quicker and more likely to have autopleuridesis, um, meaning that they could um, have that um, uh, apposition of the visceral and parietal pleural surfaces and they could have the catheter removed. And so for that, we've actually started to advocate more for draining um, the pleurix catheters every day. So what if you were to combine some of this and you were supposed to um, you placed a tonal pearl catheter and then maybe you want to put talc through it um, and you want to see if that's going to allow somebody to get the catheter out even faster because the median time, again, like I mentioned, for people to have it is 50 days, 5-0. So they did look at this and they looked at this in England as well. Um, and they randomly assigned people to have talc via the um, indwelling pearl catheter or they did a placebo and they actually did instill uh, sterile saline through the catheter. And they did that at 10 days. And they found that those that had talc through the catheter actually had a, a much more rapid time to pleurodesis, 35 days, um, and that there was no significant blockages in the catheter. So if you have somebody that is very you know, adverse to this but doesn't want to be hospitalized for talc, you know, putting in a pleurex and then, or a tonal pleural catheter, I should say, and putting talc through it is an option. So that you can see um, in there, um, um, the successful pleurodesis on this y-axis here, um, it was more successful when people used talc through the um, indwelling pleural catheters. So you may see this um, occurring um, more often. And there's, um, just quickly, to, um, in case people ask, well, um, are we going to get more complications from an indwelling pleural catheter if we have a um, uh, malignant uh, leukemic or lymphoma or hematologic malignancy? And this was a retrospective study that came out of um, MD Anderson where they actually did find that there was no significant increase in bleeding or in infection risk. Um, with those that had a uh, indwelling pleural catheter, even if they had a hematologic malignancy. Um, so lastly, well, the last option that I'll tell you about for um, treating these is the rapid pleurodesis protocol, which is basically um, combining everything I talked about. Um, and this is doing a, um, a very short hospitalization, putting in a tunnel pleural catheter after you're going into the pleural space um, and you're spraying talc onto the parietal and, um, pleural surface, and then you're leaving this tunnel pleural catheter in. You're leaving a second chest tube in just because that's how you would um, um, doing the procedure. And then um, you get a very, very rapid um, um, pleurodesis, and you're able to take off that catheter within about 10 days. It is requiring a hospitalization, and it's a little bit of an expensive procedure, but it can um, absolutely be done, and you obliterate that pleural space in a very quick amount of time. Um, complications real fast of the pleural catheters. Um, they can malfunction. This is um, in this one study is about 10% of the time. I think that's a little bit high. They can sometimes get clogged and we can unclog them. They get clogged with fibrin or any sort of um, inflammatory um, material that's in the pleural space. They get infected very, very rarely. The literature quotes about less than 5% of the time. Um, and they really are uh, much more prone to pleurodesis so that um, once you um, take them out um, because you've achieved pleurodesis, you really are minimally um, putting them back in. I think I've only had one person that I've had to put them back in. Um, if you do happen to have infection after an indwelling pleural catheter, um, you know, of course you don't want to. You can usually treat through it and keep the catheter in, give people IV antibiotics and join that pleural space. But it really um, does that inflammatory response from the inflame itself um, or the complicated pleural space infection will allow for significant um pleurodesis. So if you do have this, you know, while it's not great to have to bring someone in and give them antibiotics, um, you really are able to take off those catheters sooner um, once they are um, infected. Um, and we can put TPA through them as well 
um, to um, unclog them if they do get clogged, similar to like a um, TV that you put through a dialysis line or something like that for um, keeping them open. Um, I think for the uh, last thing, oh, um, you like we put TPA and DNAs through a, um, um, a pigtail catheter for a parenthemotic infusion. This one study, well, can we try to um, rapidly uh, remove these um, Plurex catheters or um, treat a malignant pleural effusion if we put um, TPA through that in a treatment way? Um, and this was actually a negative study, and it was using a similar medication instead of um, TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. We used uh, urokinase. And this was actually um, a negative study. So they used it to clean out the space and they put um, talc in after that. Um, and it was actually found to have a failure of thermogesis with it and it required hospitalization. So we don't routinely do that. So the point of all of this um, about talking about malignant pleural effusions is that you really should do something. Um, these patients can rapidly reaccumulate again. Um, it's best if they receive the guideline-based care and there are guidelines for this. Um, and once they do receive guideline-based care, then they get fewer subsequent procedures, fewer, fewer um, emergency room procedures, and fewer hospital stays as well. Um, so you really do want to um, treat them. And you can find management algorithms in the literature. This is just one that's coming out of um, the ATS um, in 2018 and the practice guidelines so that you go down the pathway of, well, um, does the lung re-expand? If it re-expands, are we going to do a pleurodesis? Are we going to do talc? Are we going to put a pleural catheter, an internal pleural catheter? You know, what are we going to do? And it's really based off of patient symptoms, rate of reaccumulation, ability for the lung to re-expand, and patient preference as well. Um, and that's being said because we do care about cost and effectiveness as well. So that if you were over about six months, you do repeat course and TSIS, it's about, you know, $4,000 based off of one study. Um, but if you put it in a uh, tunnel pleural catheter over um, about six months or so, yes, maybe it costs a little bit more um, for the pleurex supplies and everything, um, but it is keeping them out of the hospital. And we know that if there's any hospitalization for a complication, then that's you know up to about $9,000. So um, we do take some of this into effect um, or into account, I should say, as you know, when we're treating this and how are we going to best manage it, manage it as well. Um, there are future treatment options for managing these um, uh, malignant pleural effusions. There's going to be, um, hopefully in the future, I think it's kind of interesting, silver nitrate coated um, indwelling pleural catheter that will help to um, cause an inflammatory response much quicker. Um, I mentioned talking about biomarkers for diagnosis and prognosis. And then um, maybe, and this is you know, down the line still, is intrapleural chemotherapy, immunotherapy. Um, and then um, there is, what was being studied, uh, um, a subcutaneous implantable pleural port so that you can instill directly um, into the pleural space with um, some of these agents. But again, this is um, in the future. Okay, just um, a few more minutes here. We'll talk about pneumothorax. So um, a couple of definitions to know for pneumothorax. There's a primary spontaneous and there's a secondary spontaneous. So a primary spontaneous pneumothorax is basically somebody that comes in, they may be taller, a little bit thinner, um, as well as smokers, and this is their first time of having a pneumothorax, and for all intents and purposes, they have normal lungs. You don't know of any underlying etiology um, or family history. So you will, we'll talk about treatment in a second, but that's the definition of it. The reason for kind of um, deciding which it is, is for we want to know if there's any underlying cause for the pneumothorax. If there's not, and it's a primary spontaneous, you can, um, about a third of these will recur after the first pneumothorax. 60% after the second pneumothorax, and that's when you're really going to want to talk about doing an intervention on them. Whereas a secondary uh, spontaneous pneumothorax really has an underlying etiology to it. These are people that have COPD, that have a cavitary infection, pneumocystis, um, TB, malignancy, um, rheumatologic, so um, RA can give you um, a cavitary uh, lesion as well, um, or they have underlying interstitial lung disease, be it um, sarcoid or LAM or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And these are the ones that you're really going to want to treat initially because they have a 50% recurrence rate with it. So the other um, types of pneumothorax, there are also iatrogenic, which means we caused it, and there's a traumatic, meaning trauma caused it. Um, and how do we kind of um, grade them? How do we um, define them as being um, small versus large? Well, there are two criteria. So the um, American College of Chest Phys Physicians uses the distance from um, the chest wall to the top of the collapsed lung um, as being greater than three centimeters, they say is large. And the British Thoracic Society actually takes it as the distance from the hilum, 
um, off laterally as being greater than two centimeters as being large. You know, I personally think that it's a little bit of gestalt, and I think that it's a little bit of um, patient um, uh, symptoms as well. So somebody could have what is technically a large pneumothorax and be asymptomatic, um, and then we'll talk about ways to management. Um, and somebody may have a small pneumothorax and be symptomatic. So I, I think it kind of, um, while these are the definitive guidelines, I think you have to take into some account some of your own um, gestalt with eyeing it as well as taking patient symptoms into account. And then there is the tension pneumothorax, the dreaded thing that we never want to see. So this is basically where you have um, air entering to the pleural space, causing collapse of the lung. You have tracheal shift um, and you have um, basically um, vascular collapse, so cardiovascular collapse, where they come in with chest pain, shortness of breath, um, very tachypneic, uh, tachycardic, um, and they may be quite anxious related to it. And this is what you're going to want to fix immediately. So there are studies looking at the best ways to um, fix the pneumothorax. Are we looking at aspiration um, or are we looking at chest tube insertion? And I will say that aspiration gets um, a little bit of um, um, is talked about in the literature and it's really uh, favored a lot by um, those in the British Thoracic Society. And they have found that if you do an aspiration of a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, um, it does, they are able to treat them quite well. Um, and, um, but that uh, doesn't negate the chance that you may have to aspirate it again. So by aspiration, I mean that you're putting in a small needle, you're aspirating out the air, no more than about two and a half liters of it. Um, and then you're allowing patients to go home so that you could do this in the emergency room or even in the office um, in, um, in practice. And again, this is really more for those with primary spontaneous pneumothorax. If you have a secondary spontaneous, meaning that there's underlying etiology for it, these are those that you're really gonna wanna treat with a chest tube. This is what's favored in the literature. Small bore is favored, meaning um, about um, less than uh, 24 French, or when you get to 24 French, it's more of a large bore. Um, and if it is um, uh, you know, a, a large um, emergency, then you kind of just grab whatever you can find. Um, the other thing, when you are putting in a chest tube or you even are treating those that you're gonna aspirate, you really wanna put them on supplemental oxygen as well. And that's not for hypoxemia, but that's for nitrogen washout so that you displace the, the nitrogen and then you allow for um, um, the re-expansion of the lung. So there was a study that was done recently about a year ago, and they looked at um, those that had um, a moderate to large spontaneous pneumothorax and whether or not they could be observed um, or should they have a chest tube inserted. And this is a little bit interesting, and I don't think it's ready for prime time practice. But they observed some for four hours, and then if they were clinically stable, they discharged them with close follow-up. Or should we put in a chest tube? And after they put in a chest tube, they rapidly worked to get it out meaning that they put it on water, so they also took it off suction after an hour, and then they clamped it after four hours. And this was the um, uh, conservative group. Um, and what they found, I'm sorry, the conservative group was those under observation. What they found is that um, the vast majority did not need an intervention, that even if you were just uh, watching them, those that had this um, spontaneous pneumothorax, the majority had full lung expansion within eight weeks, um, it was actually not inferior not to put in a chest tube. They had less adverse events if you weren't putting in a chest tube. And then they had quick symptom resolution that didn't need hospitalization or work or surgery, missing, you know, or sorry, work misses or, or surgery. And they actually found that um, there were fewer recurrences over the next 12 months um, in those that um, uh, did not have an intervention. And the thought is, well, were those chest tubes somehow interfering with healing? So, I don't, I don't know if this is um, you know, right for everybody. I think maybe in those that are young and healthy and come into the um, ER with a primary spontaneous pneumothorax um, and clinically stable, maybe they can be watched with um, you know, close observation um, for four hours in the ER and then um, discharge home with close outpatient follow-up. But they have to have strict return guidelines and they also have to know that they cannot fly, they cannot die. Um, until you notice that that pneumothorax is absolutely healed and then um, probably for a little bit of time afterwards. So I don't think that this is something that, you know, is quite ready to be done at this point. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk um, about uh, pleuridesis. So um, it's really not recommended for those that come in with their first episode. So those um, tall, thin, you know, smokers that come in with their first episode of a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, you really don't need to do much about it, making sure that they don't have an underlying etiology for it. Um, if they have a second episode, yes, you really do want to treat it. 
Um, but it is um, recommended to do something for the first episode of somebody with a secondary spontaneous, so an underlying lung disease. You really want to do something about that from a pleuritis standpoint. And being, are they going to do a bolectomy and pleuritis them, or are they going to do um, a medical thoracoscopy and pleuritis them? Um, there are different ways that you can do that. If you do put in a chest tube and you're trying to take it out, um, I just thought I would go through this really quickly as well. Um, so if somebody has a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax due to COPD, um, you put in the chest tube, you admit them to the hospital. How are we going to get that chest tube out? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate for resolution of an air leak. So you're going to look in the pleura back. You're going to have them take big, deep breaths. You want to make sure that when they do so, you're not still leaking air. If you're still leaking air, it's not ready to be removed. You want to make sure the x-ray as well has no residual pneumothorax. If you have a residual pneumothorax, um, it's probably not ready to be removed either. Um, if you are meeting those two criteria, no additional air leak, and the pneumothorax has resolved, then um, there are varying ways that people will do. There's really no guideline you have to, you know, um, their um, um, indications for this, I should say. I think a little bit of this is this salt as well. So some people will water seal it, meaning that they'll take it off suction, um, and then they'll repeat an x-ray, and if it looks okay, then they'll clamp it. Some people will just jump to clamping of a um, chest tube, repeat an x-ray, and if that looks okay, then they'll remove it. So some combination there within is how you're able to remove the chest tube. If you do have a persistent air leak though, there are ways we can treat it. Um, one of the ways is we actually can use um, patient's own blood, about a milliliter per kilogram, and you instill it through the chest tube as, um, itself, and that creates a blood patch, kind of an inflammatory response there. You can send them home with a Heimlich valve, which is a one-way valve, so they can continue to kind of leak the air at home and they can um, uh, change, uh, if there's a pleural fluid that gets into the container, they can dump that. And sometimes just time helps. It takes a little bit of time for this to, to um, get better. And you really want to um, remove anything that's going to cause an uh, anti-inflammatory response. You want a pro-inflammatory response to get that pneumothorax to stop. And then after um, thoracic surgery, if you have a persistent air leak, um, there is an indication for endobronchial valves, but that's really from a, a thoracic surgical um, indication. And we certainly do use it off-label for people that have um, uh, end-stage COPD or, or other indications that really aren't able to um, uh, have uh, any other way to manage a persistent air leak. 